Hi, and welcome everybody. My name is Rachel Byrne. I'm the Executive Director of the Cerebral Palsy Foundation. And I'm really excited for today's CPF Live with Chris Modleski. Uh, Chris is the current chair, actually the research chair of the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine. Um, he is also a University of Georgia Athletic Association Professor of Kinesiology and the co-director of UGA's Pediatric Exercise and Motor Development Clinic. Uh, Dr. Modleski has been studying disability with a special emphasis on children with cerebral palsy for nearly 25 years. And one of his primary areas of research is in the assessment of musculoskeletal systems using different imaging modalities. And then also he has a focus on determining the effect of different treatments on the musculoskeletal system and physical activity of children with cerebral palsy. So welcome, Chris. Thank you, Rachel, for having me. Of course, of course. So for those of you who saw the town hall the other night, we had a little bit of a technical uh, difficulty. So we really wanted to uh, give our community the opportunity to ask uh, Dr. Modleski some questions and also talk about uh, some of the topics around exercise and physical activity. So we'll sort of get started and please, you know, make sure you put your questions in the comment box. We'd also love to know where all of you are tuning in from. So, you know, please say hello. Um, but to get started, from your research perspective, can you share how muscles and bones are affected by cerebral palsy? Oh, sure. So uh, it, it depends on the level of, uh, and the degree of involvement of cerebral palsy and how active and, uh, the children and adults uh, are. Um, so, the muscles tend to be uh, smaller. Uh, they tend to be, um, the quality is, is not as good, uh, tends to be infiltrated with uh, fat and, uh, and collagen. Also the, the belly of the muscle tends to be shorter. So the belly of the muscle, that's the part that, uh, that uh, contracts. Um, so overall muscle smaller, uh, uh, it's the quality is not as good, uh, shorter, thinner. Uh, also, there are some studies suggesting that the architecture is um, is not optimal. Uh, it's not as you would see a, a typical muscle, but it, that may be dependent on the the muscle um, and how that's affected. And, and really, the studies are we need to do more studies to uh, to look at that more closely. And why and, is it so um, important to understand, I suppose, what is happening at the muscle level? Because, you know, obviously, you know, we know that there's lots of different types of cerebral palsy and whether someone has spasticity or dystonia or ataxia or hypotonia. But why is it important to know what's going on at the muscle? Well, uh, the muscle is what is the, you know, what allows the person to move. So um, in order for you to, to move around, your muscle needs to be able to contract uh, and contract well. And the bigger the muscle it is and the, the, the higher the quality of the muscle and the, the better the architectural arrangement of the muscle, uh, the stronger the forces that it will generate and the, the more things that someone can do. Uh, it's also... Uh, a reservoir for protein. So protein is necessary. It's a, not only a, it's a, a metabolic uh, fuel, not, not a major metabolic fuel, but it is, uh, but also it's important for uh, other tissues in the body. So like your, your blood cells, your, uh, your vessel, your, yeah, your, your blood cells, your vessels, your lungs, uh, your heart, uh, that all, you know, there's protein in, in all those uh, different tissues. And then also, um, if you have strong muscles that are working well, then you move more and you expend uh, more energy. Um, so that's important for reducing your risk for chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease and, uh, and diabetes. Yeah, I think that's such an important connection when we're thinking about musculoskeletal health you know, it really impacts every other, you know, component that we have when we're thinking about our health, as you said, you know, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, mm -hmm. respiratory health, all those other, other pieces. Now, if we think about the bone, what's going on at the mm -hmm. bone 
sort of level uh, for cerebral palsy. Is it the same sort of outcomes as what we see in the muscle? Like, for example, you know, increased fatty deposits or, you know, is it different? Well, uh, the muscle and the bone are, are very connected. Uh, so the muscles, uh, many of them attach to bones. Um, so in some ways, they'll mirror uh, what the other is doing. So uh, like I'd mentioned, smaller muscles, uh, the quality of the muscle is not as good. Uh, the architectural properties, depending on the muscle, may be uh, compromised or not as you would expect. Uh, and the same with bones. So bones um, tend to be smaller, uh, thinner, um, and the fat within the bone uh, or the, the marrow within the bone tends to have a higher concentration of fat. Uh, so from a, a chronic disease standpoint, that's not good. If you have more fat within your, your bone, uh, that's an indicator that you're at a higher risk for uh, diabetes. Um, also, if you have a lot of fat in your bone, then that's, um, you know, you have cells in the marrow and they have, um, you know, they can go in, in different directions. So they can become bone cells or they can become fat cells. Uh, and if you're doing things, you know, loading the bone and, and doing things that you would expect someone to or would want to do uh, from an activity standpoint, then they're more likely to become bone cells and be stronger and, and have thicker shells. Uh, but if you're not, then you're gonna tend to have more fat within the bone and then have higher risk for uh, uh, cardio, you know, different uh, chronic diseases. Also the, um, the structure of the bone. So the, uh, if you look at like a, a long bone, uh, it has marrow in the middle and then it has walls or a shell and that keeps uh, the bone strong and it provides support. So if you wanna move around and if you're not loading the bone, uh, like a lot of people with the uh, cerebral palsy, uh, then it's the walls aren't as thick and it's a weaker bone and it's more susceptible to fracture. And then also on the ends, you have spongy bone, which are, um, it's a lot more uh, porous, um, uh, but it is, it, there's like a network of a uh, of bone and, and that is in people with cerebral palsy, uh, tends to be a lot less connected, thinner structures and more susceptible to, uh, to fracture. You just use the term loading the bone. Can you just explain a little bit what you mean by that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, loading the bone means um, uh, creating um, forces on the bone that uh, trigger cells within the bone to um, make more bone. Mm -hmm. So for, uh, so loading the bone, like examples would be just standing, standing, you're loading the bone, uh, contracting the muscle, uh, you're loading the bone. Um, so loading means you're putting um, stress on the bone, and then it causes a strain. So the bone sees this stress and it, uh, uh, depending on the level of stress um, and the strength of the bone will dictate how much strain there is on a bone. Uh, so if it's a weak bone uh, and it's a thin bone, a small bone, and you put the same level of stress that you put on a, a bone that's stronger and bigger, the strain on that bone will be greater and the the risk for fracture is greater. And I think it's really important when we're thinking about, you know, obviously bone health, thinking about the consequences of some of these different things. And I know research has sort of really focused on potentially how do we look at improving, you know, the quality of muscle and the quality of bone. Mm -hmm. um, has research shown anything that this changes as you age for people with cerebral palsy? Well, or do we not know yet? I, I think, you know, I think we can talk, obviously go into a fair bit of, you know, what do we know? What is the research showing us? But, sure. um, you know, is it, do we have things to sort of say, okay, you know, as we age, it does actually deteriorate. You know, we know cerebral palsy mm -hmm. is uh, the brain injury, obviously, or, or what's happening in the brain doesn't necessarily deteriorate mm -hmm. and get worse. 
But uh, what do we know about muscle and bone? Are, are we seeing um, changes in that as people age? Well, I wish we could do more studies to determine what's going on with the muscle and bone as people age. There's not a, there's not a lot. Just in in research in adults with cerebral palsy, there's not a lot. Um, and I think you know whether or not uh, it gets worse or it gets better. I think it really depends on what the person is doing, the kind of uh, care that they have, uh, whether or not they're participating in activities that would promote muscle and bone growth and health and development, uh, or if they're, and, and so that would be the loading, uh, but also uh, dietary. So that you need a dietary support. Um, so taking in enough uh, minerals and, uh, Taking in, you know, enough good proteins, um, and coupling that with uh, with activity. Um, so, if you have someone who's doing, um, you know, doing things that you would want them to do as far as physical activity and, and having a good diet, then they're more likely to have uh, good bone and muscle growth and development. And also, if they maintain that during adulthood, then they're more likely to have uh, better bone and muscle health. Uh, but, you know, if, uh, if there are, um, uh, like say surgeries or injuries, uh, those are times when you become vulnerable to uh, losing muscle and losing bone. And, and can we, when those things happen, do you get back to what you were doing before? And if you don't, then that could lead to, um, you know, loss and uh, muscle and bone. But as far as what the bones and muscles look like in adults and in older folks with uh, with cerebral palsy, we need we really need to do a lot more research. I'm sure if you talk to uh, clinicians, they would have a better sense. Um, but we don't actually don't have a lot of tremendous number of physicians who treat exclusively adults who have cerebral palsy. Yeah, no, it's definitely a gap in the re a gap in the research, and and something that mm -hmm. you know, as a foundation, we're absolutely prioritizing. Going okay, not only can mm -hmm. we look at say clinical care guidelines for adults, but what are the gaps in the literature? You know, we really, as you said, don't know what is happening to muscle and bone. We don't know, you know, then potentially what are the best interventions and recommendations. But mm -hmm. I do love how you brought up nutrition because I think we talk obviously with cerebral palsy it being a physical disability we talk a lot about you know movement and muscles and and bone and mobility and all those different things but when we think about long-term outcomes of health so cardiovascular health and all those other important pieces nutrition plays such a pivotal role that's so, right it does yeah so when and and we'll we'll get into your research now, has there been things sort of shown that go, okay, in uh, adding with the research to go, all right, this is what we're doing from a physical perspective. Do mm -hmm. any of the research studies currently add nutrition as a component of those studies as well to try to, you know, as you said, add in protein, add in those different things, or is that also something that we really sort of need to study in the future? Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what, you know, I've been away from the nutritional part of, uh, of research. Um, but what I, what I know is that um, nutrition can be hard to monitor. Mm -hmm. um, so if I wanted to know what your diet looked like and what kind of changes you need to make, um, you know, some of the, the standard uh, protocols for that would be to assess your you know, have you fill out a diet record yeah. uh, or diet records and, and try to evaluate those. Uh, but oftentimes people don't do a very good job of that. So it doesn't always reflect very well what a person eats. And also if it's in a short period of time, um, you know, there are fluctuations in diet. So it's, it's hard to capture that. Uh, but there are definitely uh, studies that could be done with nutrition and couple those with uh, especially with physical activity and exercise, uh, that would be, I think, really um, would have a lot of promise and help, uh, you know, create some uh, 
uh, better guidelines for people in, in nutrition. No, I, I think it's such an important part to, you know, as anyone who's listening to think about, you know, if you're starting a new physical activity routine or doing all those different things, you should also talk to your doctor about your nutrition and go, mm -hmm. okay, does it match up to what you're trying to achieve? Whether it be, you know, to, to improve, as I said, cardiovascular health, whether it's for, you know, weight loss, whether it be any of those different things, you know, obviously it's a really important piece for them to discuss with their doctor. Sure. But before we go on to you know, what's next in research and even the current research project that you've got going on, what type mm -hmm. of exercise and physical activity do you recommend as particularly helpful when we're thinking about, you know, obviously muscle and bone, which in turn mm -hmm. helps with chronic disease and cardiovascular fitness? Well, I, I think it depends on the person and what they can do, but anything that would, um, that would create interaction between the muscle and the bone would be would be good. Um, so any type of uh, physical activity, especially when you're up and, and moving around, if you can do that, if you're able to uh, ambulate, then uh, that's going to provide the most uh, loading on the bone. And if you're not able to, um, you know, if you spend most of your time in a wheelchair, then I would try to get up as much as I can and try to stand like standing itself is loading, uh, loading the bone and, and, and uh, uh, the less support you have, the more your muscles work, the better. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you're, you know, you're able to move around then you can walk and run. Um, the more of those things, the better. And if you have, um, you know, you have activities that you like to do. So mm -hmm. if you want to go out and, and play some kind of game, then that's great. Anything where you're running and walking, running. Uh, but also if you had a structured exercise program, so exercise is physical activity, but it's a structured form of physical activity. And um, during those, a structured activity or exercise, um, I would do things where you're, you know, putting more stress or more strain on the bones and the muscles. Um, so, you know, trying to do things where you're moving weights or moving your body and moving, if you can move weights, then that would be good. So like a certain percentage, maybe of your, your body weight, um, any kind of anything that would involve uh, resistance. And I think there are studies uh, showing that, uh, it's not just like strength training, but also like power training. So power training where. Um, you're not just moving uh, the joints, but you're trying to do it in a more, you know, like jumping is a, is a power type of activity. Uh, and not only would it stress, uh, uh, have an effect on your muscles and your bones, but also, you know, a lot of activities involve jumping. And I know a lot of people who have cerebral palsy, they have a very difficult time with that, even with the if they have a milder form, but if you can do it or work toward something like that uh, and you get stronger and better then then your, your daily life, the things that you do uh, will be easier. Yeah, I think it's sort of this sort of really fine balance, right? To go, okay, how do you find, as you said, exercises, which are a very structured program to help improve strength, improve endurance, improve all those different things so you can then go participate in the things that you love to do. And mm -hmm. you know, I think that's sort of being, you know, you sort of see these shifts happening where potentially actually as a, as a therapist, when I first went in, we, we really focused on going, okay, let's, you know, fit in exercise wherever you can during the day. So it was mm -hmm. like, all right, if um, you're a student and you're going to the bathroom, then you should use your walker to walk to the bathroom and things like that. And then we found that by the end of that day, students were kind of exhausted and they couldn't then do a structured exercise program because they'd been mm -hmm. trying to do all these other things throughout the day. But sure. I think what yeah. we're seeing now is actually sometimes these structured exercise programs that actually do focus on strength, as you said, do focus on loading and power mm -hmm. and all those different things may give sort of more benefits in the long run mm -hmm. um, and allow then you to participate in all the things that you love. So, you know, I think it's definitely watch this space when it comes to exercise prescription, particularly for CP. I think there's a lot of studies going on so that we can hopefully have you know, better recommendations in the future 
and say, you know, this is really what we, we think from a different type of exercise perspective, the quantity and all those different things that people should be doing. Now, I would really love to sort of discuss your study that you've currently got going on. Um, could you sort of describe to everybody uh, the current study that you're recruiting for? Sure. Um, so we uh, have a study that's uh, funded by the, the National Institutes of Health. Uh, we are looking at the effects of a, a mild vibration um, intervention uh, where people stand on a, a mildly vibrating platform. And we wanna know uh, the effect that it has on the muscle uh, properties. So some of the things that we described as far as the muscle uh, the size, quality, and, and architecture. So we want to look at those things, uh, also look at muscle function. Uh, we're also interested in uh, seeing what the, how, how the vibration affects balance and coordination. Um, and then how do those things, um, the vibration, and maybe some of the, hopefully some of the changes that you make in balance and muscle, and how does that affect uh, physical activity? So uh, children wear activity monitors and we track uh, their changes over the course of the study. Um, and we're looking at, uh, we're enrolling children who are five to 11, uh, who have ability to am ambulate independently. And it's a six month uh, intervention. And then there's a six month uh, follow-up. And there's a lot of testing. We do many, many different things. Um, so there's a, a very scientific uh, component to it, uh, but we also hope that there's a fun component where the, the children and the families interact with the, uh, the students and the staff who are you know, on the front lines and actually you know, collecting the data and, and making the study work. I think they really enjoy, uh, enjoy that. So when you're thinking about vibration, because obviously, you know, mm -hmm. people might have thought, hang on a second, that's not really something that I would have included in, you know, an exercise routine. I'm sure people have potentially seen the vibration plates. Mm -hmm. Is there a hypothesis or thinking behind it that it's increasing load? Or what is, what is the thinking behind why vibration might be beneficial? Yeah, I, I think it, it depends on the type of vibration uh, so the vibration that we use is a very low level. Uh, so we think it may be uh, creating some local changes. So activation, potentially activating uh, the muscles. So making the muscles work a little bit or, or stimulating them to, uh, to contract. And uh, we're thinking that maybe that will increase the size. Also the, the quality of the muscles. So if there's a activity, the muscles active, uh, then it's using fuel that's in that area. So fuel would be fat. So if we, if it's using fat to contract, then uh, that would be good because it's uh, improved the quality of the muscle uh, and, and, you know, long-term potentially uh, reduce your risk for developing uh, chronic uh, diseases. But uh, yeah, that's, um, there's a local effect, and then we think there may be a, a central effect where it's um, potentially affecting the central nervous system and improving, um, you know, balance and coordination. And there are some some studies suggesting that it does, and not just with uh, cerebral palsy, with other other um, conditions. So we're very we're optimistic. Yeah. Um, and then there are different, like I said, there are different types of vibration. Some are, are, are really more vigorous and they have a much, probably have a much more uh, stimulation, greater stimulation of the muscle. Um, unfortunately, a lot of, there are studies coming out, but uh, they're just, uh, there need to be studies where you have good controls. So you may have a study and it doesn't have a control group. So it's, and, so I don't know if it's the vibration or if it's something else or, and usually the vibration is coupled with something else. It's not just vibration. It may be some sort of therapy. Uh, so is it the therapy or is it the vibration or is it a combination? So a lot of the, the studies that are have come out haven't been able to tease those things apart. 
I think that's the tricky thing when we're thinking about cerebral palsy and researching cerebral palsy, right? The quality of research really needs to be there for us to be able to find these sort of definite answers, I suppose. Um, so question for you. So you said five to 11 year olds, um, it's over a six month time period. Is this an intervention that they're then doing at home or are they having to come in um, to you know, UGA to do this? What, what does it look like in that regards? Yeah, so they come in, they come to UGA or we screen them ahead of time. We talk to them, talk to the, the families, the parents and the child. Um, and then if they qualify and they seem to be good candidates, then uh, they'll come in and we'll do, you know, we'll sign a consent form and we do all of our uh, baseline testing, which is a lot. It's a lot of testing, uh, but we're trying to find us out as much as we possibly can. And then uh, the, the families will take the vibration platform home and the child stands on it every day for 10 minutes. And they do that for six months. Uh, okay. And they'll come back for testing at one month to see if there are any short-term changes. And then they come back at six months to see, you know, after the full uh, intervention, if there are changes. And then we look a month after that to see if there are positive changes. Uh, do, are they sustained in a one month period? And then we look again at six months and see if, you know, they're longer term uh, sustain, sustaining of the, uh, of the changes that we hope to see. So for those watching, do you have to be sort of local to the, your area? So local around uh, Georgia to mm -hmm. do this or can you, you know, be from other areas to participate? Well, it would be great if you were local, it would be easier, um, initially it was a lot easier for us, but we've done a lot to um, make it so anybody could participate in the study. So uh, we have a hotel that we that the families can stay in. So usually at each time point, you'll be here for two days. Uh, so you may come on a Friday, fly in on a Friday, stay at the hotel, and then in the morning, we'll start our testing, and then you stay in the hotel again, and then uh, come in the uh, come back for testing in the morning and then fly out. Some will do some testing if they come early enough, some testing on Friday just to kind of make the, the days uh, a little shorter. Um, and we actually just got approval from the NIH uh, or we're in the works of that where we may be able to, uh, we weren't able to pay for flights, but I think we're gonna be able to, I think we're gonna be able to contribute or pay for flights up to a certain amount. And we already give a, a travel stipend. So there are, you know, there is money to help with uh, the families. Well, I do think for anyone listening, you know, if your child is between five and 11 and, you know, they are ambulatory and, and you know, can, can move around and do those different things um, independently. Is that right, Chris? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, because some of the tests that we do um, requires the, you know, require the child to walk and we want to look at their gait. And so, yeah, they'll, they'll need to be able to walk independently. So I think, you know, if, if you do have a child that meets that category, I think this is a wonderful opportunity because as you said, obviously supported to actually participate in any of the assessments, but the fact the vibration plate actually goes home with you and, you know, for mm -hmm. the majority of the six months, it's actually getting done at home and it's, you know, it is 10 minutes a day, but really in the big scheme of things, that's actually, you know, quite a minimal time. Um, and I think one of the biggest things you're finding is that kids are actually finding that it's fun and they're finding that it's enjoyable. Yeah, we're, we're trying to make it where um, it's a, an experience. Mm -hmm. So an experience, uh, we, we have a local mascot um, or a mascot for the university, Harry Dog. So we've scheduled some appointments where he comes and he'll meet with the, uh, with the children. And we would like every child to, to meet him because you know, it's fun to do that sort of thing. And then we also have a, a scavenger hunt. So people families come and then we give them a little, uh, uh, you know, description of the university places they can visit. And uh, so they have to go out and find them. And it's a good way to, to find out about the university. And, you know, our football team did win the national championship this past year. So it's good that they can see those sorts of things. So we've got lots of questions and comments coming in. And I think some of them are, you know, 
really interesting. Uh, one asked, would someone send me the name of the study with the vibration plates? Yes, absolutely, Michelle, we will send that to you. Um, and we'll make sure all the links to, you know, how to reach out and how to, you know, contact Chris and his team is there. You can also go to cpresource.org and look at our clinical and research trial section. Um, you know, we've had other people sort of asking a little bit about um, what are some of the best exercises uh, that you're thinking. You know, someone, Jessica actually recommended adaptive physical education programs at public uh, colleges are a great option. So finding, you know, the colleges that actually have those as part of their programs and participating there, um, you know, if you're older or if you're looking for something that might work for you. Um, so we've got a question for somebody um, and they've actually written that therapy is not working for me anymore. Do you have any suggestions? And, and I think this is an adult with CP. Hmm. Therapy is not working anymore. Well, yeah, like, and, and I uh, think this is something good, I suppose, when we're looking at adults and looking at, you know, what can we do? Um, this is where more research is needed, right? Because I don't know, we don't, we don't necessarily have all the great answers. Yeah, that's, it's so true. And uh, so, I mean, you could try to find some other therapists that maybe have more experience with working with people with the cerebral palsy. But like I said, the, um, the research is not where it needs to be. And it's especially not where it needs to be uh, with adults. So we're lagging behind with the children and we're really lagging behind with adults. So the, the, like our study, um, it may not, you may not qualify, um, but if you can help us get the study done, like reach out to other people who don't qualify and say, hey, you need to participate in this uh, because the sooner we do the studies, this is a trial, this is funded by the National Institutes of Health and there are other trials and we're not going to we're going to go as long as we possibly can to get all the people that we need and answer the questions as well as we possibly can. Uh, but until we finish the studies, we can't move on to other studies. So like this study right here, technically it should be done at the end of May, but we had trouble uh, recruiting at the beginning and then we had the pandemic. So we're behind in our recruitment. So if we can, if you can help us get the people we need, then we can move on to other studies. And, you know, funding agencies really want, um, they want these trials to be done so they have reason to fund other trials. But if the trials are not successful, it makes it hard to say, oh, we need to keep investing money in this area. Yeah, you know, I think uh, it's such a great point when we're thinking about, you know, how can the community be involved in research, you know, mm -hmm. actually participating in it is one of the biggest factors, because, as you said, unless we get the results and move on, then getting future funding is really difficult. And, you know, for everyone listening, it's Cerebral Palsy Awareness Month uh, this month, mm -hmm. and we are really advocating for federal research funding. And we're doing that because of all the gaps in the literature and all the gaps mm -hmm. in our knowledge that we don't have. And, you know, when we're talking about these large research studies, we need federal funding because they're expensive, you know, and mm -hmm. private foundations like ourselves and like others, they're too small to try to fund those huge studies. You know, I think we're great for looking at uh, funding pilot projects and speed ideas. Mm -hmm. um, we really need the, that federal support um, to take these to the next level. But as you said, funding agencies are hesitant sometimes to continue funding things if they're not seeing results, if they're not seeing, you know, the community participating. So yes, please, if you are able to, A, yourself um, participate in these research studies, or you know somebody who this would be, you know, potentially really good for, um, you know, it's it's not only potentially a benefit for you long-term or your child, I think it, you know, can really benefit others to help us identify those gaps. So, you know, thank you so much. Chris and you know we've got uh, lots of questions in the chat we'll make sure we answer them so um, please go back and check we'll, we'll type those out for you but just wanted to say a huge thank you for joining us today and um, yeah look forward to hearing the results of this study yes so do I <laughs> amazing thank you thanks for thank having you. me I really appreciate it